Welcome to Chanel Lucian Radio Show with Wilda Wiaka, bringing up today's leading experts to uncover ever deep and spiritual truths and the latest scientific developments in support of the evolution of humankind. For more information on Mission Evolution Radio with Wilda Wiaka, visit www.missionevolution.org. And now, here's the host of Mission Evolution, Miss Wilda Wiaka. Hello. Thanks for joining us on Mission Evolution. We're coming to you on Exxon TV and Simul TV from our broadcast studios in St. Catharines, Ontario, Canada, bringing the latest evolutionary information from today's leading experts. This hour, we'll discover dreams as medicine and magic. From the Tibetan dream snake to shamanic dreamscape, ancient peoples not only acknowledged the value of dreams, but actively worked with them. Given we spend approximately one third of our life sleeping, a good portion of that dreaming, what are we missing by not working with our dreams? Joining us from the UK to explore the mysterious world of dreams is Sarah Janes. Sarah is the author of Initiation to Dream Mysteries Drinking from the Pool of Nemosin, researcher, public speaker, and workshop facilitator. She runs the Explorers Egyptology Lecture Series and curates Dream Place a re reawakening of the temple sleep tradition of antiquity by blending dream incubation, philosophy, art, science, and symposia at sacred sites and cities around the world. Her website, themysteries.org. Sarah, thanks so much for joining us on Mission Evolution. Thank you so much for having me, Gwilda. It's a pleasure. How's the weather over there across the pond? Uh, quite depressing, actually. <laughs> <laughs> I won't tell you what we've got going here then. Good. Thanks. <laughs> So, Sarah, what's your educational background? Uh, I actually went to drama school. I've just uh, been interested in dreaming ever since I was a child because I had really amazing dreams as a child. And um, I had a daughter um, in 2008, and I went through a really, really long period of sleep deprivation, as you do. And prior to that, I'd always had the most incredible, amazing dream life. And... Um, my background was working TV, film, and uh, the music industry. And once I had my daughter and I went through this period of being able to sleep, obviously looking after a young baby, I, um, I decided that I didn't want to do late night types of work again. So I thought I might like to go to university and study something along the lines of anthropology or neuroscience or something like that. So I started to seek into lectures at the University of Sussex, but quickly realized that academia wasn't really for me. But I did meet a lot of very interesting academics. So in order to kind of tailor my own bespoke education, I invited them to come around to my friend's house and give a talk on a subject of their choosing. And then I charged all of my friends five pounds to come around for dinner and listen to them talk and then gave them whatever cash I made. So... I've kind of tailored this weird, um, my own kind of university course to some extent. I've been doing it since 2012 and I've had some amazing speakers who have gone on to been, be pretty well known. Um, everything from neuroscience to um, psychology, ancient culture, research, Egyptologists, um, Assyriologists and uh, scientists of all kinds of disciplines, really, from like AI technology to sex robots we've spoken about. So, yeah, it's been really interesting. It's amazing talking to the leading edge people, isn't it? It just broadens one's horizons. Yeah, absolutely. And I think in the context or in that environment of taking people out of lecture halls and universities where they're used to kind of delivering their material in uh, perhaps a way that's quite sort of rigidly controlled as well through the institutions. When you meet some of these people in a more kind of relaxed kind of setting with a few glasses of wine, you get quite a different impression and picture quite often. So I had a president of neuroscience, Anil Seth, come to speak at my club as one of the first speakers and he spoke about the science of consciousness and he's gone on to, to produce like a, a very successful best-selling book, Being You. So these, you know, academics, I always worked with bands prior to that. So I always worked with a lot of American psychedelic bands. And it's a lot easier to organize one person to come speak to a room full of people than a whole band to perform at a venue. So I really enjoyed it. And I've learned so much as well. And because you are getting these kind of uh, firsthand interactions with people as well, it means that you can ask your own questions. So rather than looking at things online, or uh, reading their books, having them in front of you, 
having read that book, being able to ask them the questions that you want to ask is, is absolutely amazing. Great opportunity. I can imagine. I can imagine. So your bio says you're a researcher. Mm -hmm. <laughs> what do you research? Um, predominantly at the moment, it's uh, ancient incubation cults in the in ancient Greece, really, is what I'm most interested in. My book is a sort of history of the dream being considered a form of magic and medicine, mainly in the Western esoteric tradition. So I'm interested in traditions around the world, but the Western esoteric tradition, the history of Anatolia through the ancient Near East, Egypt and Greece is what really interests me because I feel that that's my heritage. You know, that's our sort of ancestral wisdom in the West is in Anatolia, in the ancient Near East, in Egypt and Greece. So that's something I've been fascinated with. And actually one of my guests in my lecture club, um, Dr. David Luke, he spoke about lucid dreaming and about um, uh, the existence of sleep temples to me for the first time in I think about 2012. And this just hugely inspired me because it was this obvious uh, marriage to me of ancient cultures and the power of sleeping and dreaming. So because I've always been fanatical about sleeping and dreaming, always had amazing lucid dreams, and they've, be they've been a preoccupation for my entire life. So I've, I've read everything I can about dreaming since I was a child. Um, this idea that there was this ancient cult of dreaming purposefully was really um, incredible and fantastic to me. So that started the ball rolling on me researching the, the ancient cultures of dream incubation using dreaming as a spiritual practice, I guess. What is dream, dream incubation? So, so you do do an egg. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so, well, it's a bit like... Um, uh, incubating your kind of and and nurturing your dream to provide something that you want so the simplest essence of dream incubation is that is um going through any processes or rituals that help you get the dream that you want so you might incubate a dream because you want to meet in the ancient world a particular god or goddess or you might incubate a dream because you want a solution to a problem that you're facing and you can't think of it in your ordinary waking consciousness or so so is it, it is a dream fulfillment as well. So is a dream incubation like setting your intent where you want your dreaming to go? It's a very strong intention. And in the ancient world, that would usually involve like certain ritual practices to achieve that aim. So things like purification, fasting, making offerings to the gods, praying to the gods, and uh certain sort of psychodramatic techniques are employed in, in those temples as well, where you know the the people working in the temples may dress up as the gods or goddesses, or they may perform some sort of rituals to invoke the gods. So in invoking the gods, um, do they invoke them then into the dream of the people that are in the temple? Yeah, exactly. So for the longest time, even in deepest Stone Age history, I would say, ancient people believed that dreams were this portal to the other world. And this other world was the realm in which uh, deceased people went to once they died. I mean, I do think that dreaming encouraged some of the first ideas about religion, about this idea that there's an afterlife, because it's incredibly convincing evidence, really, for anyone who's ever had a dream that they've met a loved one, a deceased loved one in a dream. It's a really powerful, moving experience. And for ancient people, I think that would have been considered really strong evidence that you go somewhere when you die and that this place Places accessible through dreaming. So, um, I know so, the, I know the um, uh, some of the ancient traditions, like the Aborigines, looked at it the other way around. They believed they dreamed this reality into being. Um, is there some form of dream incubation, if you will, that can then impact ordinary reality? I think so personally, and and certainly this is something that was used in more of a mythological way in, say, ancient Greek sleep temples. So in the ancient Greek sleep temples, the Asclepians, because they were dedicated to the dream healer god Asclepius, they were, they were places where you were to undergo a kind of pseudo-death because death was seen to be the brother of sleep. So by going through this ritual, this fake death, and in this fake death, you're able to have contact with this dream healer, God Asclepius. So this is the ideal realm in which to encounter Asclepius. Um, 
your sick self dies in that dream world. Your sick self dies in the underworld of where Asclepius is, is king. And then when you wake up, you're reborn and you're reborn healthy and well. So um, in the Asclepian tradition in ancient Greece, dreams were considered to be um, divine dreams where you had contact with the gods or goddesses were considered to be um, able to spontaneously heal someone through dreaming, through contact with the divine in the dream. I know um, I've actually interviewed some people that have had uh, dreams that allowed them, that showed them that they had uh, a physical illness that hadn't been diagnosed yet. Um, is it kind of related to that where you start to become in tune with another access point to your, your health? Yeah, absolutely. And that's something that ancient Greek physicians talked about, the fact that uh, you may start to see in a dream your body and your um your humor as a kind of landscape. And so within the dream, it may be revealed to you areas of your body that are not well, that you might not be consciously aware of. Is um, We're just about out of time in this segment, but is spiritual illness also addressed in that way? Yeah, absolutely. And I think in the instances of the ancient Greek sleep cults and a lot of these dream cults, you can see these as being kind of Western manifestations of shamanic healing practices. They're essentially considering that sickness and illness is something that uh, the gods give you and the gods have the power to take away. So the shamanic healing traditions, was this practice, uh, do you consider what was going on in the ancient dream temples in, in Greece um, shamanic in nature? I absolutely think, yeah, it's very shamanic seeming in nature, this kind of magical view of the world and of um, dreams as being a route into the spirit world, definitely. Well, shamanic journeying is a form of a dream, is it not? Mm, yeah. And it's, it's, it's uh, I believe, common to all shamanic practices, and there's, they're all over the world. It's pretty amazing how they all spread, you know, here, here and there and hither and yon, and yet they all have so much in common, don't they? Yeah, absolutely. And I, and I guess this has a lot to do with the fact that we, you know, ancient people had a different hierarchy of states of consciousness, or, you know, that's one way of expressing it. So dreams were considered to be just as important. These altered states were considered to be just as valid and as important and things that people experienced in their dreams. You know, one of the sort of preoccupations, one of the main preoccupations with dreaming in the ancient world is this idea that dreams can reveal the future. So that uh, in and of itself speaks well, volumes about the way that people were viewing dreaming. Well, we're going to have to take that station break. Sarah and I will return very shortly, so don't go away. This is Mission Evolution, www.missionevolution.org. Are you interested in evolving with the times and becoming all you can be? Don't you wish there was one place to find the latest information to help guide you through the process? I'm Gwilda Wiecka, host of Mission Evolution Radio TV. Join me on my mission to find the latest evolutionary knowledge and tools. The guests on Mission Evolution are leading experts in a wide variety of divergent topics including allopathic, holistic, and integrative medicine, epigenetics, enlightenment, quantum physics, meditative practices, environmental issues, spiritual evolution, trauma healing, and so much more. Mission Evolution Radio TV is aired worldwide through the Exxon Broadcast Network, Exxon TV Channel 32 on Simul TV. You can enjoy our archives of radio or TV shows with our compliments at www.missionevolution.org. Come see the amazing lineup of guests and topics. With more than 200 episodes to choose from, you're sure to find what you're looking for. Visit www.missionevolution.org. Hello again. This is Mission Evolution, missionevolution.org. With us this hour discussing ancient dream culture is Sarah Janes. Her website, themysteries.org. Sarah, you brought up an interesting topic, and that's precognitive dreams. Um, isn't the trick in precognitive dreams all about interpretation? I mean, this is the thing with ancient dreams 
predicting the future is it's more in in line with the oracular tradition and this idea of decoding a dream to work out what it reveals about the future so quite often it requires those future events to unfold before you can decode the dream properly and what's interesting is most of the dream interpretation and most of the ideas of uh, decoding what a dream means are to do with language and words and homophones and uh, wordplay and puns. So a lot of predictive dreams like that, they aren't necessarily revealing a kind of um, visual representation of exact of something exactly about to happen. They're more like clues and hints and oracles about what may happen. And then in Mesopotamia, where I like this idea in the ancient Near East, there's certainly this idea that Basically, the gods are in charge of your fate and destiny, and you're allotted these personal gods in the ancient Near East when you're born. And if you do something to annoy them, then they withdraw their favor from them. So you have to be careful not to annoy the gods, obviously. And one way they might show you that they're not happy with you is by sending you nightmares. And then um, if you have like a bad oracle, you have some sort of bad div divinatory warning, an omen, um, you can plead with the gods, placate the gods, and then they can change your your fortune for you so I quite like that idea it's not set in stone there's uh opportunities to change your fate at any time if you make the right kind of um uh, prayers and offerings so the precognitive dreams are more like tapping into the wave that's moving through things rather than exactly what's going to come in the future yeah, absolutely. I think so. And there is this idea of the future being kind of flexible, you know, that it's it's morphing all the time, like a dream, I guess. So, um, you know, my my feeling about dreams myself, having had a lot of lucid dreams in my life, is you get this sense within the lucid dream of how your thoughts and feelings manifest your reality. In a dream, you get this an, as instantaneously. As soon as you think something or feel something or want or desire something in a lucid dream, it appears. And I think life works the same way. It just happens more subtly and more slowly. So is that is that um, akin to praying to the gods to change your future? Isn't that a form of setting your intent and therefore um, affecting a change in ordinary reality? I think so, yeah. I think that um, it's useful to have the gods. I realize, you know, in the course of my research, I've kind of realized how useful the gods can be because they give your attention this kind of psychic target. They you can visualize the gods, you can see a statue of the gods, you can think about the gods as a sort of tangible, um, real being. And it's harder to to um, to focus your attention on something vague and nebulous, like an idea or a theory or the cosmos. But if you think there's a god or a goddess and you can imagine them and you can see their body and their faces, then it's easier to kind of like send your intention towards them, to adore them. There's a lot to be said for adoring. One of the tricks I always give people when they come to my workshops about how to get a lucid dream is if you have a crush on someone, if you're really strongly attracted, if you adore someone, then it's easy to conjure them up in a dream because that desire helps you create them. And once you do create them, you'll quite often find that you'll become lucid because you become excited and happy to see them. And I think this is something we can look at in the ancient world because ancient people adored the gods and goddesses. And with that sense of adoring a god or goddess, when they were to appear to you in a dream, I think it's quite likely that ancient people would have become lucid and awestruck and it would have been a magnificent experience for them. Oh, interesting. So are the gods and goddesses kind of like a, a allegorical representation of a particular set of uh, characteristics and then adoring is to align with them? Yeah, I think that's absolutely correct. There's definitely this sense of, you know, if you look at um, sun gods, for example, you can see that this god has been conjured up to epitomize the qualities of solar power and the sun. And uh, there are so many nature gods in ancient Greece as well. And, you know, for example, my favorite goddess is the goddess Mnemosyne, who my book is dedicated to, the goddess of divine remembrance, of eloquence, of eruditeness. She's the goddess of sense making. And to me, she's almost like the the personification of lucid dreaming, because within lucid dreaming, when you become lucid, you kind of remember who and where you are perfectly. And you're conscious of the fact that you're in this fabricated realm of your imagination and you have this incredible awesome feeling and I think that Mnemosyne personifies that for me she's the mother of all of the muses so she is the source of all inspiration so I think uh, in a way she's a chief she's the chief of the muses so she is the 
the highest form of inspiration, which is something that I think you can experience in dreams. When you feel lucid, you um, feel deeply inspired. So, so you've been speaking about lucid dreaming. It, for those of us that have maybe not had or recognized a lucid dream, what is it? How can you tell you're having one? Well, for me, a lucid dreaming is knowing who and where you are when you're in a dream. And this this often for me comes with this deep sense of like bliss and ecstasy quite often. It's like a full body experience being in a lucid dream. Um, scientifically speaking, um, neuro neuropsychologically speaking, your frontal cortex is activated. So you're able to um, access self-critical thinking and um, uh, self-reflection, critical thinking and you just know who and where you are it the the dream world is very sort of tangible and real feeling often people describe it as being more real feeling than ordinary waking reality so <laughs> that sounds really exciting in that you you're who you are you think like you do which you can fly or you yeah. can okay got it. now well, can you, you have this sense as well in a lucid dream that you're it's more than being an avatar in an imaginal realm it's this incredibly expansive sense of the fact that you are the entire universe that you're dreaming up. So when you fly in a lucid dream, it's not like you're an avatar flying through this alien space. It's like you are the entire space. So you're the air that lifts your body up as well. It's a, it's an amazing feeling. And I think that in terms of consciousness research and memory research, we should really be looking at lucid dreaming because I think it offers this incredible window into understanding how we work as human beings and how we connect with the rest of the world. It sounds very much like you're talking about uh, a form of joining with a unified field. Mm, yeah, there is this sense of ecstasy, which I think is quite interesting in lucid dreaming. So you, de you definitely get this sense of bliss and ecstasy when you're fully lucid in a lucid dream. And that sense of being able to manifest what you want when you want and um, to morph and change your reality is extraordinarily empowering. It's why I think lucid dreaming is, is a lot of potential for self-therapeutic practices as well. So if we, if we create something while lucid dreaming, does it make it easier than to create it in ordinary reality? Oh, absolutely. I think lucid dreaming is this perfect realm to work magic, to manifest things that you want to happen in your real life. And the the more you kind of conjure up your desires in the dream realm, the more likely you are to see these things happening in um in your waking reality. I mean, if you think about it, human beings really are just the stories they tell themselves. So we can change our lives in, in so many different ways. And often we get stuck in a rut and these things seem incredibly difficult. But um, lucid dreaming and, and really having wonderful dreams hugely is a hugely enriching aspect of life. So some of us are more gifted than others as far as being able to access the dream realm, remember our dreams. Is there a way that we can develop this skill? Well, one of the one of the kind of stock answers is always keep a dream journal. Like writing down your dreams really does help because I think lucid dreaming is deeply entangled with memory. So any memory exercises you can do, any um, supplements, any nootropics that are good for cognitive um cognitive function and memory can be really useful for lucid dreaming like lion's mane for example um is a useful one and ginkgo biloba and things like this anything that improves the memory tends to improve uh, dream recall and then the more dreams you can remember the more likely you are to become lucid as well so um i've also heard that the b vitamins i think b6 in particular can yeah. be useful because neurologically it's uh Sharpens yeah, I think that's true as well. I always find that I have more potent lucid dreams after I've had a steak for dinner. <laughs> <laughs> I know some people that would really appreciate that advice. <laughs> so um, if you're starting to have lucid dreams, are you able then to direct the dream itself? Yeah. So I think lucid dreaming is kind of a spectrum. So some lucid dreams, you can you can literally tear the fabric of that dream reality. Other lucid dreams, you're fully conscious within the dream, you know who you are, and yet you're not able to exert that much influence. So I think that it's, it's less cut and dry and less black and white than than it necessarily gets represented. And I think that there's a whole sort of palette of lucid dream type experiences you can have. So if we're lucid dreaming and we're working with drink, dream incubation, can we find ourselves lucid dreaming around the topic or the people that we want to? 
Yeah, absolutely. So setting an intention, you know, one thing, one thing I would say about trying to encourage lucid dreaming is just make a ritual out of going to bed every night. Or if you're really tired at the end of the day, and you don't have a lot of headspace for creating this ritual, um, perhaps you can allot some time for afternoon naps, because afternoon naps quite often can be lucid, because we tend to have quite shallow sleep during afternoon naps. And um, quite often there is background noise or there's more light than we would nor normally experience. So afternoon naps can be really great. Uh, one thing I would recommend is yoga nidra can really help you to relax and to just be able to expand that hypnagogic experience. Because one of the best ways for me of, of having a lucid dream is when you um, practice what's called the wild technique, the wake induced lucid dream, where you you start thinking about a dream that you want to have and you you fall into that hypnagogic reverie as you're falling asleep and you follow like, you know, I describe it like Alice falling down the rabbit hole. You just hold on to this sort of slight awareness of the fact of who and where you are and you drift into a dream. And as you'll see um, during hypnagogic reverie, quite often, if you're thinking about things or ideas or words pop into your heads, you'll notice that those things will flash up immediately. It's like you manifest them instantly. And so what happens when you drift through hypnagogia, you find yourself in the dream. And like in Alice in Wonderland, the, the dream world is like the corridor at the end of the rabbit hole. And then you're in this this world in this this dream world. And if you can maintain an awareness of drifting off to sleep, that can really help. And isn't that uh, we're just about out of time in the in this segment? But isn't that where we do access these kind of dreams? Is when we're at that that transition point between waking and sleeping. Yeah, I mean, lucid dreaming often occurs in the last portion of REM. So our brain and body does prioritize deep sleep because we need this for cellular regeneration, for processes of homeostasis, for all of these kind of recalibrating processes that keep us healthy and well. Deep sleep is absolutely vital. So what we find is, you know, we have these kind of bundles of REM throughout the night and that last 90 minutes before we wake up for the day, that tends to be where most lucid dreaming will recur, occur. So it's when we've had our deep sleep, when we've got these um, shorter cycles of REM out of the way and we start to have more longer, luxurious cycles of REM. This is why not looking at your phone station, when you wake up is so time, important. It's time for that station break. Okay. We will continue, so you stay right there. This is Mission Evolution, missionevolution.org. So I was watching the X-Zone TV channel last night when I was abducted by aliens and they kept repeating to me over and over again, simultv.com, simultv.com. What's simultv.com? That's what I asked them. They had it written on the side of their UFO. How do you spell that? UFO. No, I mean simultv.com. S-I-M-U-L-T-V.com. S-I-M-U-L-T-V.com. Right. S-I-M-U-L-T-V.com. Interesting that you were abducted by aliens in a simultv.com UFO last night. Oh, yeah? Yeah. Now that you mention it, I remember now last night I was awakened from a deep sleep. My great-grandmother was standing there. She said she'd come from the hereafter to tell me about simultv.com. She even spelled it out for me. S-I-M-U-L-T-V.com, sonny boy. S-I-M-U-L-T-V.com. S-I-M-U-L-T-V.com, sonny boy. Wow. Yeah. Guys, you'll never guess what my psychic guru just told me. SIMULTV.com. Exactly. Are you guys psychic too? Of course. We all know about SIMULTV.com. SIMULTV.com. This is Mission Evolution, missionevolution.org. Our guest this hour is Sarah Janes. Her website, themysteries.org. Sarah, we mentioned earlier that um, sometimes dreaming can be like being in the unified field, particularly lucid dreaming, which begs the question, can we meet other people in our dreams and work with them while we're asleep? I would say yes to that, but that's just... Um, uh 
my own personal experience of meeting people that I know in dreams and, you know, acknowledging that we've both seen each other and confirming that we've seen each other in dreams. So, and there are lots of anecdotal reports of people encountering people they know in dreams and having these shared experiences. So what would be the purpose of that? Um, is it something that you've set up ahead of time or when you just suddenly find that happening? What, what's the purpose? What's really going on there? I think that's something that can be really validating because for me as a child, having these kind of dreams was incredibly validating and interesting and made me question reality and made me question um, what I was told in school about the nature of reality. So that was my kind of introduction into this idea that there is something beyond our individual kind of experience of life as individual beings, that there's some interconnectedness occurring there. And I think that this interconnectedness can occur in the dream state quite often. Do you think the interconnectedness is also promoted in ancient times by worshipping the same gods and goddesses as, as one went into dream incubation? Yeah, I like this idea that you were mentioning earlier about you know, when you're adoring a God and this God has certain qualities and everyone's getting high together on this feeling of adoration that they somehow, I think they unify in this this sense that they have in their bodies and minds of just adoring. I um, went to my local church recently and I got this real sense standing in the, the audience there that when people were having this kind of ecstatic experience listening to music, that they were kind of joining up vibrationally in a feeling sense they were just lifted up by that sense of adoration as an audience that certainly starts to make a lot more sense out of the aesthetic aesthetic dancing and and um worship that was done by indigenous peoples yeah i recently visited um lf Sina, the site of the sanctuary of persephone and demeter in greece just south of athens and I had this real sense there. There were this is where the mysteries of Alephsis were held. So this was um, a kind of a mystery cult in ancient Greece that celebrated the descent into the underworld and the rising up from the underworld of Persephone. And she's a, a goddess of spring flowers and was abducted by Hades and taken into the underworld. And the mysteries involved all these initiates taking part in a big festival where they would walk something like 23 miles from Athens to Elefsina. And um, they would congregate at this great sanctuary. And I had the real sense when I was there this spring, all these spring flowers were blossoming of just how ecstatic it would have been for ancient people to... Um, to feel themselves in spring into this kind of blossoming, amazing, they called it the sacred orgies, the mysteries of Alephsis, because I think there was this orgiastic appreciation for life and abundance and fecundity when the crops would start to grow again, when the flowers would grow again, when it would warm and it became just pleasant and beautiful. So let's talk about daydreams a little bit. We talked about how dreams can be precognizant. And um, I've had, and I've had other people, you know, express to me times when they were having a daydream only to have it take place right there afterwards. Um, where, do, where do daydreams play in with this? It depends on the nature of the daydream, really. I mean, I used to daydream a lot when I was a kid, and I guess they were sort of hypnagogic types of experiences. Um, I was I spent a lot of time sleeping and dreaming. So I was very familiar with that state and I found it easy to access when I wanted to. And I think this is why children have such fantastic dream lives quite often. I do a lot of workshops with kids and they will often tell me like great details about their dreams. And I think part of that is because they're exercising their imaginal abilities all the time. And as a child, I remember playing, imaginary play was a huge part of my life. I just imagined stuff like I could see things and it wasn't like I was kind of going mad and having hallucinations I was just able to hold this kind of imaginal overlap and see a kind of fantasy scenario or give life to dolls in a house for example or little creatures or even I remember playing with a circuit board and, and imagining it as a city with lots of cars and people in houses and stuff so I think children just have this natural ability to imagine things and as we grow older we tend to focus too much perhaps on material real things what's already there versus creating it mm, exactly um, if, if you can't imagine it you can't create it can you mm, yeah that's a good point I mean I think that we probably need to um 
reawaken our inner children a little bit. <laughs> a lot, maybe. <laughs> How do you think that imagination and dreams relate? Well, I think for me, uh, when I had my daughter in 2008, I didn't dream as much. I wasn't sleeping very well, so I didn't have very good dreams. And I felt bereft. I just didn't feel like myself at all because I felt such creative enrichment from the dreams that I had. Like every morning I'd wake up and I felt like me because I had dreams and because I was exploring this dream world um, that I loved and that felt like a manifestation of my psyche and my inner world. So to lose that was really, really distressing. And then when I finally got back to lucid dreaming, I was so appreciative of it. Um, and it really made me want to um, think about dreaming a bit more, think about it a bit more consciously. When I was younger, I used lucid dreaming more in terms of wish fulfillment. You know, if I had a crush on a boy in my class, I'd like kiss him in my dream or I'd get good Christmas presents, stuff like this. And then after I had my experience of sleep deprivation, I really appreciated just how amazing dreaming is and how it can inform creativity. I like to use things and symbols that appear in my dreams in artworks, in stories. And I use story quite a lot in my book because I really love writing um, stories and fiction. And I wanted to incorporate stories and fiction into my book because I think that when you read a story, when you read fiction, you engage with it in a more sort of deep way. Um, a meaningful way you you are able to feel emotionally connected and imagine yourself in a scene that quite often doesn't happen um, when you read nonfiction books. Speaking of which, um, I've again heard a lot of people and experienced myself where a lot of inspiration, um, information, things that you're going to write about come through in my dreams or I'm just starting to wake up I'll write down what's going through my head real quick and it'll absolutely align with what I'm with the project I'm on and the information I'm trying to bring through how does that work and where are we getting that information well I think quite a lot of that can be put down to kind of contact with your higher self and there's an aspect of dreaming whereby dreaming tends to work by association so you make these novel associations at lightning speed that you aren't necessarily making with conscious waking um uh, thought processes. So dreaming can be incredibly useful for problem solving, for example, because you're able to have an overview, a dispassionate uh, view of a situation. I think that a bit like the way uh, psilocybin or magic mushrooms are being used in things like marriage counseling, a dream can help you see a situation from somebody else's perspective and give you this it, this really incredible overview where you feel less emotional um, about uh, sort of things that you might ordinarily take personally. Dreams can help you feel things from other people's perspectives. So when you're in a dream um, and you're getting this information and you say it's possibly coming from your higher self, what do you mean by higher self? I mean, I think there are, we have, we have an extra extraordinary memory that I think is quite underestimated and we're taking in information all the time. I do think there's also a collective consciousness which we can tap into. Um, but I think we're aware of a lot more than we think we are. And in dreams, we're processing this at a rate of knots. It's happening so fast. And we're able to make these novel associations across this vast amount of information that we are privy to um, really quickly. So I think that quite often this can lead to these sort of inspirational aha moments. But I also think that dreaming does provide access to this kind of collective field of consciousness. So perhaps in certain, certain circumstances, something entirely new pops up in a dream that we have never experienced before. You've mentioned several times now the speed at which this things happen when you're dreaming. Why is that? Why why is there more speed in, in our dreams than there is in our waking times? I think it's a really fascinating area of study, how we perceive time in dreams. And um, I have a friend, Daniel Aldis, who's a dream researcher in California, and he was telling me about a study he did where he was trying to um, make sense of time perception in lucid dream episodes. Um, one thing that I feel in lucid uh, dream episodes, and he mentioned this in his study, is you... You know, like most people say, this idea that you can have a dream that lasts 30 seconds, but when you wake up, you feel like you've been asleep for an hour or something. So much has happened in that dream. And I think that can be true. But quite often in lucid dreams, you get this sense that 
time doesn't necessarily pass more slowly. In fact, in lucid dreams, people are able to count accurately how much time they think has passed, for example, like an amount of seconds. So they're able to track time um, and it seems to track with our ordinary perception of time in a lucid dream. That's one of the defining features of lucid dreaming actually is that time seems to pass the same as it does in waking reality. And also you're able to remember a lucid dream perfectly. You won't have any issues with forgetting a lucid dream because of the way that your um, mind is working when you're having a lucid dream. But the experience I do have, and this is how Daniel's study played out as well, is this time expansion seems to happen because you're not experiencing time from one fixed point. You seem to be experiencing time from multiple perspectives somehow. Um, time just seems infinitely expanded. So there's no time. And yet you're still able to track time according to your ordinary waking perception of it. I wonder if, if our mind and our, our imagination being freed up from our you know, our body's just laying there re repairing itself. So it's not demanding that much of our attention. I wonder if if being freed up from, from the bodily experience helps with that. Yeah, I think you could be onto something there. I think that's true. And I think another thing with in terms of the body and dreaming is, you know, this is one of the things I don't understand with regards to the study of consciousness. Even in the, taking the most materialist, reductionist view possible that consciousness resides in the brain, that's ridiculous because the brain is just part of our body and our organism. So even the most um, materialist, reductionist tests of consciousness should be scanning the entire human organism because it doesn't make sense to just look at the brain. Um, I find, I've always found that really peculiar. And I think with regards to dreaming, we're also experiencing the world in a different way. We're having this like full body experience. As you say, we're paralyzed when we're sleeping and dreaming. So we aren't able to move our bodies. The only things that move are our eyes and we're obviously still breathing. And I think well, you can make tiny micro movements in your fingertips. It's that time again for another station identification here. So please stay with us. Sarah and I will continue to explore the hidden power of dreams. This is Mission Evolution www.missionevolution.org Do you have a product or service you'd like to promote to a worldwide audience? Imagine your product featured on Mission Evolution Radio TV. If you're interested in showcasing your work, Mission Evolution is broadcast to the Exxon TV Channel 32, Simul TV, on the Exxon Broadcast Network, YouTube, iTunes, iHeartRadio, Amazon Music, Audible, and many other audio and social media platforms. Our professional studios can produce and broadcast your custom high-quality ad. It will be permanently embedded in each episode and featured in the archives for years to come. Together, we can make it happen. Contact us at info at missionevolution.org for more details. Spaces are limited, so don't miss out on this great opportunity. Email info at missionevolution.org today. Welcome back. This is Mission Evolution, missionevolution.org. This hour, our expert guest is Sarah Janes. Her website, themysteries.org. Sarah, I know we've danced around it and spoke of it a little bit, but let's go a little deeper into dreaming and healing and, and how dreams can be healing. Well, that's um, very interesting, isn't it? That's something that I'm particularly interested in, looking at all of the research from especially ancient Greek sleep temples, where this is really well documented. Uh, they were apparently successfully healing people in dreams throughout 2000 years. Um, the Greek medical system started off as being mostly a sort of magico-religious healing modality. So mostly healing because of spells, magic and ritual, and then slowly developed into more surgery, medicine, and um, just the ordinary kind of doctoring and physician types of interventions that you might expect these days. But, you know, one of the things I find incredible about the ancient Greek tradition is they had this fantastic sense that I think we need to get back of holistically healing people, thinking about the place where they were being treated as being beautiful, aesthetically beautiful, full of nature, full of um, 
beauty and trees and flowers and pure water and springs and all these kinds of things I think we need to bring back into modern healthcare because I think there's a sense that I certainly get from looking at ancient Greek ideas about healing that there was this idea that people could be healed by harmony, by beauty and by contact with nature. And I think a lot of this does probably stem from the fact that I don't think ancient people overly identified with self, perhaps in the way that we do these days. I don't think that um, they saw themselves as entirely disconnected from their community or the rest of nature in the way that we often do these days, because we have so much less access to nature and we have so much less access to say proper dark skies where we can see the stars and we can have some sense of the fact that we exist on a planet. It's our great loss, isn't it? Because there's a certain amount of balance. Um, that our body needs. I mean, our body came from this world, right? Uh, and then we separate it from it, it to our great detriment, I would think. Um, is that what you're talking about? Yeah, absolutely. I think that I was just watching some Studio Ghibli um, films with my daughter recently, and they really kind of, um, they really celebrate the beauty of nature in these films. And you get this incredible sense of how awe-inspiring nature is. When I think about the most awestruck I've ever been in life it's always in nature looking at like incredible vistas looking at the stars looking at sweeping valleys or just magnificent sunrises and things like this and um, I think our culture is is sort of accidentally depriving us of these things and something like the night sky you know the the deeper I dag in dag the deeper I dug into my research in terms of the roots of these sort of ideas of um spiritual healing and divine healing in dreams and gods and goddesses associated with dreaming, the more I realized that these beings all came from the stars because people just adored the stars. People believed the stars were gods and goddesses and the planets were gods and goddesses and they, they were the ones influencing life on earth. And I think because of the fact that we have so much light pollution these days and we are addicted to devices, we don't recognize the fact that we exist on a planet in the middle of the cosmos enough. And these kinds of things are enough to... Um, make you realize that your life is insignificant in terms of the universe, but also extraordinarily fortuitous that you exist at all. So how does um, dreaming then relate to reconnecting with the natural world? Well, so in these ancient Greek healing sanctuaries, for example, they were always really beautiful natural locations. So I've just come back from the sanctuary of Asclepius at Epidavros. And this is just in a really beautiful location. You can see the sea is surrounded by mountains, it's surrounded by trees, and all of the um, healing sanctuaries would be encircled by this sacred grove of trees. And this, I think, somehow separated the world of the mortals from the divine um, sanctuary within because this this sort of self-contained city that made up this healing sanctuary was very much um, set apart from ordinary space and time. It was this place where the God could actually appear to mortals and people would, uh, one of the rituals was eating a feast with Asclepius, with eating food, sacred food. And this was a kind of early form of communion. Oh, isn't that interesting? I, I hadn't put that together at all. So um, let's let's get a little bit into the magic portion um, of of dreaming. Uh, you talked about rituals. Um, how does magic play into dreaming? For me, um, dreaming is a tool for making contact with something that is greater than yourself, and having the ability in that expanded dream state to comprehend it to actually comprehend the magnitude of something cosmic and vast, that your ordinary waking consciousness exists on a much more narrow bandwidth, I think. I mean, even, even looking at dreams uh, in terms of them as a visual experience, I find it quite interesting because within dreams, you have kind of 20-20 vision, you have this omnipotence. So I think in a dream, you have this ability to um, absorb much more information somehow. So I think that in itself can be really powerful. And as we mentioned, I think that dreaming is this um, 
incredibly useful tool for manifesting things that you want to come into your life because it gives you an opportunity to practice manifestation and to sort of fine tune and curate your experience of the world and bring people that you want into your world and things like this as well. Um, and then in terms of ancient practices, dreaming was something that could reveal the future. It could reveal the solution to a problem. It had a lot of different magical applications and it was kind of the primary form of magic in some ways in the ancient world as well, because it was certainly the kind of premier divinatory um, um, method and uh, was used to work out courses of action, successful courses of action quite often. Amazing. If we've reached that point in the show, Sarah, when I have to ask you, what is your mission? My mission is to uh, reactivate an interest and love of dreaming to improve healthcare and um, culture. I think culture is vitally important and we're really, really missing culture. We need a rich culture. Um, I think it's vitally important for human beings to love the world and to love one another. And we achieve these things through culture. Yeah, it's a beautiful mission because we have se segregated ourselves to the point that I think we're all suffering for it. So what do you think, um, how do you see uh, our technology in our, in our modern world impacting our dreaming and our ability to dream and use our dreams? Well, one of the sad things with technology that I'm noticing more and more is it's hugely impacting culture. People just can't be bothered to do or make anything anymore because they're so horribly distracted by banal, uninteresting things on their devices. I think it's really sad that they'll spend hours scrolling through ads for things um, and not creating. I think we need to return to creating and dreams are a vital source of creative in inspiration. So I think that if we can get back to dreaming, then we can be inspired to create things in the world that will inspire other people. Um, I actually do think that virtual reality and the way that technology is moving might accidentally end up encouraging lucid dreaming because the way that we engage with tech and devices at the moment is all on flat screens or for the most part is on flat screens and scrolling. And um, virtual reality does involve looking into a sort of 3D imaginal space, much like a dream does. So I actually think that there's been this unhealthy entrainment of looking at flat screens and devices and scrolling rapidly up and down. And what virtual reality might do is mean that more people are generally looking through virtual reality headsets and seeing things in this 3D space, you know, in the same way that we do in ordinary waking consciousness when we walk around. So that could end up meaning that you're more likely to have lucid dreams because your eyes are practiced in this way of looking at the world. Um, and there is evidence to show, there's a few papers written, I think, on the fact that gamers actually have more lucid dreams because they're using these virtual reality headsets and they're exploring a 3D space. So a lot of it is about visual entrainment that can be really helpful for lucid dreaming. So we're right now, if we're getting all of our information and our supposed inspiration from scrolling and things that have already been created, there's nothing new coming forth, is there? There's not a lot, is there? And, and I think even in terms of you look at the average high street these days and you look at the average uh, new build or new housing place or new hospital, there's no culture there. There's no beauty. There's no sense of the aesthetic. And I think that beauty and harmony in our environments could actually heal people in subtle ways if you're somewhere beautiful as opposed to somewhere ugly and horrible where you have views of nature where the air is clean I think we had we used to have this understanding of healing um up until incredibly recently and more and more we are separating ourselves from the natural world from the sense of needing and requiring beauty it's not a luxury we we should be investing in it I couldn't agree with you more so how do you see bringing and working with dreams back into main culture um, impacting the world, impacting our future? I think um, they can help us problem solve. I think dreaming can be incredibly useful for making novel solutions to problems that we haven't 
encountered yet. So I think it actually could be employed in corporations and businesses that people spend time dreaming and sleeping and napping to have good inspirations. And inspirations that come from dreams are quite often very good. I don't know how many inspirational dreams, um, you know, really terrible leaders have had, but there's plenty of information about people, artists and creators and, and kings and queens having inspiring dreams that have helped them to make good decisions. So I think dreams often offer really good solutions to problems and it's something that we could reincorporate back into our culture and I think children need to rediscover dreaming they're the most important ones and that's the biggest tragedy as well if children are on devices and therefore um, neglecting their dreams and therefore not given the space to develop themselves in dreams I think we actually develop ourselves in dreams you know babies spend an inordinate amount of time in REM they spend something like 80 percent of their um time in REM and I think during that time period they're constructing their ideas of themselves they're constructing their inner world they're creating a memory palace or psychic architecture of who they are and where they are and why they are and without that they're going to be lost and zombie-like and I think it's really important that children especially young children don't use devices too much because they're horribly distracting and and um, addictive and they they um, atrophy imaginal capabilities. Absolutely, they do. Well, unfortunately, time has just flown and we're now out of it. Sarah, thank you so much for coming on the show and sharing your wisdom. Thank you, Gwilda. It's a real pleasure. Thank you for having me. Our guest this hour has been Sarah Janes, the author of Initiation into Dream Mysteries, Drinking from the Pool of Mosin. Her website, themysteries.org. This has been Mission Evolution with Gwilda Wiecka. For more information or to enjoy past archived episodes, visit www.missionevolution.org. And please be sure to join us right here next time as this mission continues, bringing information, resources, and support to our evolving world. Mm -hmm.